Acts chapter 2. Uh, I'm going to do this while I've got it. I hope he's watching. That's just the picture I took of Brother Sterling uh, a little more than an hour ago. Uh, I Obviously, he doesn't know that I took the picture uh, or he would not have been looking at the camera. Sterling does not like to have his picture taken. He does not like to pose. And I, I, my joke is whenever we have people here and they say, Pastor Mike, can we take your picture? I always tell them, I'm, listen, I'm really camera shy. And they're going, oh, I'm sorry. And I just start laughing, you know. And they're going, you are not. Yeah, I know that. Uh, but Sterling is. He's camera shy and he don't like to look at the camera if he knows it's looking back. So I was getting ready to tell him good night and I just held my phone up and click. Got a good snap of him. Uh, he is he is doing uh, he's he's doing f- okay. He is. Uh, they're not really concerned about his heart. They're not really concerned about his lungs or anything like that at this point, which is good. Um, there he had a at, at at first it looked like they were saying that he was going to have a he was going to be a high risk surgery that there was probably a good chance he would never make it off the table. And, um, and so anyway, but then they reassessed him, and, and whoever did the assessment said that uh, he's a moderate risk, uh, so go ahead, and that approved him for the surgery. And um, so, so far, everything has gone uh, the way that they've wanted it to go. Uh, he's, they're going to move him. In fact, this evening, they may have already done it, Moved him to a place on the fifth floor. That is their rehab place. He's going to be in rehab for a couple weeks and uh, getting strength back. The doctor uh, told Sterling that when he went in there to go and manipulate his hip, the ball joint there, that it looked like was literally crumbling in his hand. And uh, he said, so that's how bad it was. And so the, the plan is now he's going to have the right side done. And uh, so anyway, he's got to go through this all over again. And I'm going, he's going to be so busy with you. He's not going to fool with me. And um, so anyway, just continue to pray for him. And uh, we miss our brother and we want him back here at the house of God. And uh, I've got a whole list of things that he's, I'm going to have him do when he gets back. <laughs> yeah, we got some st- We got some work around the house that needs to be done, Sterling. You need to get up and get after it, all right? Acts chapter 2. Um, I want you to think of uh, what we learn in Acts chapter 2. I want you to think of it as uh, the beginning of, I don't, well, I don't know if I, about the, the beginning of it, but certainly... One of the solid foundations, one of the pillars, as it were, of the doctrine and the idea that God always had it in his plan to make sure that any people who wanted to hear the plan of salvation and the word of God in their language, God will do it for them. And this is what we're going to learn as we go through this. And um, I've been buying some books. And I've got some of them up here. I've got the the biggest one, surprisingly. This is the complete Wycliffe Bible. Old Testament, New Testament, and Apocrypha by John Wycliffe. You say, now why the Apocrypha? We don't use the Apocrypha. John Wycliffe was a Roman Catholic priest. Just for him translating the Bible into English, 44 years after he was dead, the Pope at the time decreed that he was a heretic. They dug his bones up, burnt them to powder, threw them in the Thames River, to be scattered out so that his body has no resting place. And I go, who cares? Amen. What does God need to know? My address before I can be resurrected. 
No, but I've got this Bible here. Now, uh, let me just say this to you. He had to translate this out of the Latin Vulgate because the Catholic Church had cracked down on anything relating to the Greek originals or the Greek copies of the New Testament of the Bible. They had, they had cracked down so much on that, there was only one thing that Wycliffe could get his hands on, and that was the Latin Bible that he, that he studied out of, that he undoubtedly went through seminary and was trained to read. He, he probably knew Latin, could speak it, frontwards, backwards, sidewards, crosswords. It all sounds Latin to me, pig Latin. Okay, he probably learned that one too. And um, so he translated the Bible out of, out of uh, Latin. Then, and this is what came in first. This is the Tyndale Bible. Now notice something. Smaller. It's actually it's done that way for a reason. Uh, whereas Wycliffe, and there's some question as to whether or not Wycliffe ever actually translated a single word. But he had a group of disciples, young tree, priests in training, that believed what he believed, that the people ought to have the Bible in their own language so they can hear it, hear the gospel. And uh, I'm going to read you something tonight. But anyway... This idea, uh, when Tyndale came along, this was actually translated out of the Greek text, not the Latin. And Tyndale wanted a Bible that was just big enough and small enough for, for a person to carry around. Okay, and he accomplished that. Then I have the Geneva Bible up here, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Well, let's read Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, this kind of stuff here fascinates me. I love, I'm a history fan anyway. I love to study history, anything related to history. I like it. I could go to a, I could go to a history museum and set up a tent outside and camp out and go in there for a week and just spend and look at stuff and be, go, ooh, ah, look at that. Uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each one of them. So however many people there were there, uh, a, uh, the, the visible sign that those people were being sealed by God's Holy Spirit was there. And it, it could be seen. Who's, who really is on God's side? Who is it? Now, the Bible doesn't mention here uh, in this chapter that there, might, that there was some there that all, they didn't get no cloven tongues. That uh, doesn't mention those who didn't. All it did is mention those that it sat upon each of them. So we assume that all of the people that were gathered there were gathered there by the Holy Ghost. He had been, they had been approved by the Holy Ghost. And, uh, and so let's, we'll move on. Uh, let's read uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And as you're reading this, remember, this is where we're going for I don't know how long, but this is where we're going. By the way, I'm, I'm working on a Watchman broadcast series on the history of, of our Bible, how we got it. How we got it from the very beginning. How did we get our Bible? Okay. I think it's important for people to know that. Because you're always going to have someone challenge you. And say to you. Well. You know we use many translations in our church. What's wrong with that? I think you can hear God out of multiple translations. I think the more translations of the Bible you get, the better off you are. You can really hear what God was really saying there if you have all these multiple copies of translations. And I, I put that um, in, in this format. Um, let's, say that, um, let's say that John was uh, in, in, in a trial... 
and they were accusing him of breaking the law. And uh, he's an American citizen, so the law to him means the United States Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and all the amendments to the United States Constitution, plus the Constitution of the state of Missouri, because you are now a legal resident of the state of Missouri, they can't use... Minnesota law, can they? No, you don't live there. And apparently what you did, John, was done here in Missouri. Okay? Or what you didn't do. Anyway, so let's say that, let's say that the judge says, now, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Cooley, uh, we want you to know right off the bat that in rendering our decision as to whether you are guilty or not guilty, I, the judge, am going to be using more than the Missouri Constitution and the United States Constitution and all of its uh, amendments and so on. That we're going to use some of the laws that are on the books in England. We're going to be using some of the laws from the European Union. We're going to be using uh, some of Sharia law in, in helping to understand whether or not you did something wrong. And John's like, uh, I don't think so. And then the prosecution says, uh, Your Honor, uh, just so that uh, Mr. Cooley will know, we plan on doing the same thing. We plan on using uh, examples from uh, Great Britain, from Canada, from Mexico, uh, from uh, Sharia law in the Middle East. We plan on using all of them. Uh, communist, communist law from China. We've got some examples from there uh, of why uh, Mr. Cooley would be guilty. So we're going to be using those as well. Got a problem with that, John? Huh? Why would you have a problem with that? I mean, you did something, and even though in the United States, there's nothing in the United States law that says that it's wrong, but in, uh, in the, the, we know the nation of Iran, why? You probably might be guilty of breaking one of Iran, Iran's laws, maybe some laws from the, uh, the, the country of Syria. Maybe you broke some of those laws. Maybe you broke communist China rules. Maybe you did that. So we're going to use all of these things to judge you. Not acceptable, is it? And that's what you're dealing with when you decide or your, your pastor decides you go along with it, your church goes along with it, your denomination goes along with it, and says, we're going to use all these different Bibles uh, that are in English, plus we're going to use Bibles that are translated into uh, Swahili, uh, to some of them into Japanese, some of them into Spanish, some of them uh, into French. We're going to use Bibles from all over the place. And we're going to determine whether or not you did something wrong according to the law of God contained in all of those books. But actually, John, you would say, excuse me. When I came to Christ, I came to him under the terms and conditions of one contract. One rule book, one law. And that was the law of this Bible and no other. Uh, I did not hear him say this personally, but um, all the man who runs the Christian Law Association, uh, David Gibbs, uh, I had heard that he had said to a group of pastors, he was giving them advice on uh, how to deal with different things in the law and so on. And he said, gentlemen, you can think what you want to. Uh, and use whatever Bible you want to in your church. But I'm here to tell you that if you're going to go into court and any matter of doctrine 
is going to be used as part of your defense, you better take a King James with you. David Gibbs is a, is a staunch King James man. And uh, he's dead right about this. If you study this book as a law book, it, the, it has legal language in it. Um, God is faithful and just. That word just means that is, is, is a legal term, juris, jurisprudence. The word just is a legal term. And it means that God uh, is bound by the laws that he himself wrote. He also is. And if God breaks those laws, why can't man break them? Amen. So anyway, that's kind of where we're going uh, with this. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us here. Lord, teach us exciting things, Lord, about your word tonight, about how we got it. Lord, bless our souls tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, and amen. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. That right there gives us the, the biblical legal basis of why God speaks more than just Hebrew. Why God speaks more than just Greek. Why God had always intended to speak to the Gentiles in their own language. So that they would not have to learn a language that was foreign to them. Instead of them having to learn Koine Greek, which is like uh, business Greek. Uh, it was the Greek that was used uh, amongst the nations. That uh, It was a common Greek spoken by the nations of the, the uh, I guess, the Roman Empire, the Middle East, uh, into Asia Minor and down into Northern Africa and so on. They were all speaking this same Greek language. They were using it in bartering. They were using it uh, as they went from one city to the next. I'm sure there was people there that spoke Greek because that was the language that everybody was going to talk in. Nowadays, what's the language they use now? English. That's, you see that everywhere. Okay, you, can, you can go to Japan right now and not be too uh, messed up because some of the signs are going to be written in English. One of the things I noted about going to Kenya so often was many of the signs written plainly in English. In fact, a lot of the highway signs were written in English, period. Nothing else. Maybe they every now and then they have Swahili there. That was a common language. But anyway, English was a very common language, especially in the bigger cities, Nairobi and, and uh, so on and so on. So they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And now when this was noised abroad, and the multitude came together and were uh, confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Again, they're not speaking a heavenly gibberish they are speaking in the language of the people who they, who God divide, uh, uh, God directed them to speak in this certain language to these certain people. And if you were among that group and you just happened to be standing in the wrong spot and here's uh, Peter preaching in your direction, you can't understand a word he's saying, but you see a guy over there, his name is John. John just, you pick up going, wait a minute, I think he's speaking. I think, honey, let's go over there. So they naturally would go over where they heard their language. And they would listen to what? Uh, Homer's uh, Iliad, the Odyssey, was a, uh, was a reading to them, the great Greek poets of old. Were they learning uh, Greek math skills at the time? 
No. Were they learning history? No. They were hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were hearing the wonderful works of God in their language wherever they were born. Um, so in verse 6, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes, and Elamites, the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea, in Cappadocia, in Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in parts of Libya, uh, about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Amen. And I want you to, now, I want you to notice something. Turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Now, to those who would say, I believe God gives His saints a heavenly prayer language that when they speak it, they do not know what it is they are saying. Now, I had, I, several years ago, as, as God was, um, as God was training me on studying the Bible, when I would be confronted with something like that, where people were saying, well, I believe God gives me a heavenly prayer language. I don't know what it is. But while I'm speaking it, I just believe it's God. And I just asked them, well, tell me what you said. I don't know. I don't know what I said. And I would say, then, how do you know that you weren't cursing God since you don't know what you were saying? And is that really the way that God, when he saves us, is that really the way that he's going to grow and mature us as uh, members of the vine of Jesus Christ? Is that how he's going to train us as members and people who are of uh, the body of Christ? Is that really how God's going to do it? When you look at Isaiah 11, there shall come forth the rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And we look at the seven spirits of God. Here they are, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of understanding. What does that mean? It means that God, and when he imparts his Holy Spirit to you, those seven particular spirits, one of them, is a spirit that should cause you to not be in ignorance of something, but to understand something. Does that make sense to everybody? When you're reading the Bible, and I know it may take a while, and you've got questions you want to ask God, and, and I'll tell you this, if they're related to prophecy... Some of those you're just going to have to hang on to until you're watching it happen and you're going, okay, that's what that was. Okay? Uh, then you'll know it. Right? Then you'll know it. 
I believe that on the day that the Antichrist is revealed, God's people will not be confounded. We will not be turned over to a spirit that will cause us to misunderstand and have no knowledge of that whatsoever. I believe we're going to know it. Because that's the spirit, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge. The spirit of knowledge. One of the things that God, uh, just a, the very basis, as God gave me a hunger to read the Bible and read it more and more and more, God was giving me a foundation of knowledge, teaching me skills on, on how to read the Bible and how to, how to interpret it, how to take this two and add it to that two and come up with four, okay? Then he was giving me the spirit of understanding, understanding why God was going to do this at this in this way or whatever. Then the, uh, the spirit of wisdom usually applies itself in the way of application and how I'm going to react to certain things because of what I know and what I understand. God's going to give me wisdom to act in the right way. Okay? Now, let me, um, let me show you this book here. Uh, I got this yesterday. I've got these two uh, today. I haven't had much chance to look into them. Um, but I, this is neat. This is a facsimile of the New Testament translated by William Tyndale in 1526. Now, this was the first English Bible that was translated from the Greek text. Okay, remember uh, what I said about... Um, um, about Wycliffe's translation was that the only thing they had was the Latin Bible, okay? And so they had to take Latin and they had to convert that to the English that the people spoke of that day, okay? And uh, there's several things in there that as I look at them with, you know, what you know from the King James, you try to go and look and see what he translated all the way back in, uh, you know, in the early 1500s and so on. And you see that what he was saying, if you make sense of it, and what he was saying then and what the King James says now, you're going, that's pretty close. I mean, it's not anything that I would just, you know, lose my breakfast over. This is, this is pretty, pretty close, including, including 1 John 5, 7. Okay, um, I have, let me see if I can find it here real quick. I found it earlier. Yeah, okay. This is not a facsimile, so it's going to be a lot easier to find in here. That's 3 John, here's 1 John. So I've got 1 John chapter 5. Open your Bible to 1 John 5, 7. So you can know kind of where I, what I'm saying here. This is the way that Wycliffe translated verse 7. And I'll tell you this. It's all there. It's all there. Which tells you something. That in the Latin Bible that he translated from, 1 John 5, 7 was there. I see Steve over there going, he gets it. So let me read to you John Wycliffe's translation of 1 John 5, 7 from the Latin Vulgate. For there been, or maybe for three been, that given witnessing in heaven. Um... The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three been un. These three are one. 
can't get any closer than that. Now, understand that the Wycliffe Bible is, I think, what they refer to as Middle English. Okay? English did a lot of changing over the years. Okay? By the way, I checked in the Geneva Bible. Yep. Now we're going to look at Tyndale. Tyndale translated from the original Greek. And here's, here's the timing now, if you look up on the screen. I, I copied that from this book. This was in the, the preface to um, the, the Bible that, that they had. Uh, under Archbishop Thomas Arundel, and he was a, he was a Catholic archbishop. And not a friendly guy at all. Catholic England had the harshest control of any country in Europe. Uh-oh, hit the, hit the wrong button. By a new statute in 1401, the heresy of not just owning, but reading a scrap of scripture not in latin however small was punished sometimes by burning alive a cruel death that could take several days just for having a scrap of paper that somebody wrote for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Just for having that in your house or in your possession, you are going to be burnt alive at the stake. That was pretty serious. Then it says later on, the English church under Arendelle maintained that the gospel was too difficult for the common people. Isn't that something that, because that's the Catholic Church today. The gospel was too difficult for the common people. But the, see, that goes against what Paul said, that, that some people can be removed from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. So he said, Scripture in Latin was given to and could only be understood by the extremely learned or by priests to whom special grace of understanding was given. Understanding, that is, not so much of the words of Scripture itself, but of the church's elaborate constructions of interpretation. In other words, so what if, if you have a, uh, like someone, like your grandmother knitted you something and she knitted into that, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Your granny gave that to you for your birthday and that would have been a that would have been something you would have held on to for the rest of your life because not only was granny giving you something she worked with her hands she's given you something that was so precious at the time people were willing to lose their life over it and it's called the gospel of jesus christ and what they're telling you is is that the reason why we're trying to save you from yourself is what the Catholic Church is saying. We're trying to say to you that you, you have this, but we're going to take it away from you because you can't understand it anyway. Yeah, but it says something very plainly here that Christ died for my sins and that all I have to do is believe in it. Trust us. There's more to it than that. And see, you have all this Bible here and we know that there's a lot more to it than just this little thing that your granny gave you for your birthday. So we're going to take it away from you. And if you promise us you don't have anything else in the house, 
with scripture on it. We'll leave you alone. But if you ever have anything else with scripture on it, we're going to take it and we're going to burn your house down with you in it. Um, so only the priests. So we know, we know what Catholic priests are capable of doing now, don't we? So imagine, imagine, a, imagine a, a, a setting here, a scene where the, where the Catholic priest... Is, un, is able to convince the young ladies of his parish that he must perform certain things on them in order for them to receive special graces by God. They have nothing with which to contradict that. Tyndale, or excuse me, Wycliffe, saw that kind of abuse. And he said, if these people could just hear the gospel in English, they wouldn't fall for this. And they wouldn't be losing their daughters or their sons like this. Amen? Amen. So, here is a facsimile page. Yes, I said the word Emily. Facts, Emily, and this is 1 John 5, and I want you to notice that the letters are slightly different, and now remember, this goes back to 1526, okay? This predates the King James by, uh, let's see here, by, by almost, almost 80 years, I would say, and... Um, he did this all by himself, translating it from the Greek text for the first time that was done. And so what he writes here is what I have underlined, what I have uh, emphasized here. Um, let me get a pen out here so you can follow, up, follow along at least here. It starts right here. For there are three which bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and I think it's funny how they spelt it, the Holy Ghost. W-H-O-L-Y instead of H-O-L-Y. And it's actually the Holy Ghost. G-O-O-S-T. And these three are one. Anybody have a problem with that? So here's my point. William Tyndale obviously had access to a Greek text that had what's called the Johannine comma. It's 1 John 5, 7. It is, it is probably the most argued over verse in the entire Bible, most of your modern scholarship will say to you, it should have never been put in the Bible um, because it doesn't really show up until A.D. 1000 in any manuscript that we currently have. Now that is close to being true. However, not only does it show up here, in, and I still haven't gotten into this study yet, I don't know exactly where Tyndale got his Greek New Testament from, but obviously it shows up in the Greek text that he's translating from, and so he includes it in the letter or the epistle of 1 John. He includes it and literally, word for word, is identical to the King James. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. 
And then it, and it continues on the way your Bible will read. And there are three which bear record in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are one. And so then it, then it goes on, okay? So the bottom line is, um, there is, to me, sufficient evidence that 1 John 5, 7 should be in the Bible. Should be. Um, my friend that I uh, went to Bible college with, Dr. Craig Shaw, he's a good friend of mine. I love him to death. We talked one day about this. He wanted to know where, uh, if I had, if I knew of any outside sources that could uh, attest to or testify to the fact that 1 John 5, 7 should be in the text. And I had just got done studying this out. And I said, uh, yeah, in the, in the writings of, well, who was the guy? Cyprian. In the writings of Cyprian, a man by the name of Cyprian, somewhere around A.D. 350, said, and I'm kind of giving you a rough version of what he said, but he said, as our dear, beloved uh, Apostle John wrote in his epistle how that um, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And I said, I have been told that that's in the writings of Cyprian. He said, hang on a second. What he was doing was he turned around to the books that he's got behind him because... He was always, I knew that he and I were going to take two different paths, but he was a scholar's scholar, man. And he just so happened to have the works of Cyprian. He's pulled it out and he said, yep, there it is right there. He said, hey, thanks, I appreciate that. The Free Will Baptist denomination had asked him to write the commentary on 1 John. And we were talking about it before he started writing it. And he said, it's really funny because he's, and I told him, I said, you know, to me, it just matches the way John would write that. Bearing record or bear witness is John's signature of things. Okay, we that bear record of him, bear witness of him, bear record, bear record, and so on. And he laughed. And I said, what are you laughing at? He said he had one professor in his doctorate program that's, that basically said, if it sounds like John, it probably isn't. <laughs> that's good logic that's some awesome logic you got there and uh so on and so on so you know what i'm just i'm i'm maybe i'm a little bit more simple but i think that if you've got one two three witnesses you got enough. Let me read the Geneva real quick. And then. Now the Geneva Bible. Is the Bible of the Puritans. The pilgrims. When they came over in 1620. More than likely would have been carrying a Geneva Bible. Um, but eventually. Uh, it would have changed over to uh, the King James simply because companies stopped printing the Geneva. Where is this? James, 1 Peter, 1 John. I'll read it to you out of here. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. For there are three which bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The only difference is the, between the word which and the word that. For there are three that bear record versus three which bear record. And grammatically, I put it like this. If you have two and then you add two to that, you have four. Or if you have two... And then you have one plus one, 
you have how many? Four. Doesn't matter how many how you got there, it's still four. So anyway, uh, I'm looking forward to doing this study, but I understand that what happened on the day of Pentecost was God record God establishing to mankind and especially to the church. I am going to speak their language. I'm not going to require them to learn mine. I'm going to speak theirs. And this is where most of modern textual criticism, modern uh, textual research and so on, this is where they jump off and say, we're not going past that. We're not going to follow that. We don't want anything to do with it and so on. We're going to stick with, if it ain't Greek, it ain't God. If it ain't Hebrew, it ain't God's word. And that's what they're going to stick to no matter what. But I think God is establishing here in Acts on the first day, the, on the birthday of the church, you could say it, in the first day of God's, God's work on the earth among the Gentiles, he's already speaking his word in their language. He's setting a precedent for that. And he's saying, don't worry about what language you speak. I, I, I wrote your language. I invented it. Okay. And I really, really messed it up for you. So you can't speak anything else but that. And um, so anyway, that's, that's part of what we're going to get into tonight. But this is the basis now for us believing that our English Bible is right. Now let me ask you a question. Right now in this world, is God not also speaking to people of another tongue? With men of other lips and other tongues will he speak to this people. So that's what I have to believe. That's what I have to believe and that's what I do believe. All right?